This is the 100th edition of Life Stories, and tonight you're going to see a really special show. Cliff Rich is one of the most successful stars in the history of British music. I've got it! I'm looking forward to it very much. I think Piers and I are going to get along very well. We're going to have fun. Cliff came to this country with absolutely nothing. Now he's become this multi-millionaire pop superstar. There must be something I'm doing right that has kept me going this long. As everyone knows, Cliff's been through a pretty rough few years being investigated for alleged sex abuse. It really did tear his life apart. I have to touch on the bad past now because I'm past it. I'll never be over it, but I'm past it. You don't get to be as successful as Cliff Richard without having a pretty steely screw. But tonight, I want to get the great Cliff Richard interview. Pierce, I may not have the answer to everything, but we need to talk. Call you now? Are you Cliff? Are you Sir Cliff? Are you well, no, Mr. Richard? What do you no, like me call? No, normally when people speak to me, they just bow. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, answer to or oh, you. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just say something. You are incredibly eighty years old. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> and I, you look about fifty. I'm fifty-five and look about eighty. <laughs> I want to take you back 36 years when I did my first ever celebrity interview for the Wimbledon News. And here we are. This is us 36 years ago. Look at oh. that. <laughs> All I remember is you were so warm, friendly, helpful to a young trainee journalist I was then. <laughs> so, actually, you're responsible for this. <laughs> Don't blame me. <laughs> <laughs> and I read the other day that you're now the same weight that you were in 1962. Is that right? Yeah, I am. I mean, that's incredible. Well, it's not if you work hard at it. I'm only, not even the same weight I was in January. <laughs> <laughs> you had your first hit with Move It in 1958, yep. aged 17. Did you ever, as a 17-year-old, Imagine that 62 years later, you would have become one of the most successful recording artists in history? You know, I thought that may be it, because people used to use the phrase, one-hit wonder, and without even being too desperate about it, you still feel that maybe that's going to be the result. It well, was... it's, a, it's a bit late now, Cliff. I mean, you've done 62 years. I mean, no, I'm not you're bothered. a 62-year wonder. Yeah, I'm not bothered. <laughs> I'm, I'm not bothered about it now. <laughs> I mean, I'm waiting for the headline. 123 hits and gone tomorrow. <laughs> John Lennon said before Cliff in the Shadows, there'd be nothing worth listening to in British music. John Lennon. He thought I was cool. Yeah. God bless him, because um, I'll always be grateful that he said that. You've had 68 top 10 UK singles, more than any solo artist in their lifetime. You're only... You're beaten by Elvis, but 21 of his came after he died. Um, so, actually, you, you know... I know, but I'm not that competitive. <laughs> <laughs> My mind is whirring and thinking one other thing about all these record sales. ka -ching. Yes. <laughs> you must have made... And ka-ching, ka -ching. Yes. <laughs> and ka-ching, ka-ching, ka, -ching, ka, -ching, ka -ching. How many homes do you have these days? I don't know. You don't know? Well, <laughs> Sorry, what? Wait a minute. Well, let's go through them. So, you have one in the UK or not? No. You've got rid of that? Nothing, nothing in the UK. Barbados. Barbados. Uh, Portugal. Portugal. I have an apartment in New York. Yeah. Wait, if you could only live in one for the rest of your life, which one would you live in? I'm drawn to the sun mm. in Barbados. Every morning, I open the curtain and I see the Caribbean. And I think to myself, how the hell did I get here? You gave us a picture you liked of yourself at your home in Barbados. I liked that because it was only about 18 months ago. I had been through a really, really bad time of my life. When I did that photograph, 
I, I got a friend to take it on the pool side of the thing. I was just, uh, I feel like I'm past it, and I smile, I put my head behind my head. Just and for it, those who, who don't know what you're talking about, this was this infamous police investigation into yeah. alleged sexual yeah. abuse, the, which uh, then all got thrown yeah. out. You were completely exonerated. But that picture came after that. I went through a, a terrible time. Well, you gave us another picture, which I think tells the story. This is a very different image. Well, explain what this is. Within four months of my accuser setting fire to my life, I had a pimple on my head. And I was in Portugal, so I called a, a friendly doctor I know and said, can you come and see me? I, I don't know what's wrong. He came the next morning and he said, you have shingles. So, and I said, well, how, how can I get shingles? He said, stress. It was so dangerous, because see how close it got to my eyes? Had it happened in my eye, I might have gone blind. And I'm, I'm happy to show this, because it's really difficult for me to explain what it was like to wake up every day at 3.15 in the morning, and the last thing you think of before going to bed, and the first thing you think of when you wake up is that accusation, which I knew was false. God knows is false. We're going to come to this a little later, because obviously uh, an enormously difficult time in your life. But when I see that picture, I mean, that's a picture of a man who's been to hell and back, but he's got back, isn't it? This picture says it all. I feel happy and healthy. So, Cliff, music trends have come and gone, but after six decades, you're still wired for sound. <laughs> yes, I am. So, Cliff Richard has sung his way to the nation's hearts for more than 60 years. He has that warmth and richness in his voice that, that touches your heart. Yeah, he's missing now. Cliff is one of the all-time greats. You just have to be in awe of the fact that anyone could have that many hit records. The young one. He might be 80, but he could be 35. One. Jumps around on the stage like a young thing. Into the car, gonna work and I'm cruising. Cliff has sold almost 300 million records. And he also became a TV favourite. This, as you probably know, is what they call discotheque dancing. And a movie star. We're all going on a summer holiday. Cliff had to learn to drive the huge bus. <laughs> Another little talent, a bus driver. Cliff first burst into the scene in 1958, aged just 17. Come on, pretty baby, let's move it and groove it. And his very first single, Move It, changed the course of British musical history. In the 50s, everything was like dance bands. And when Move It came out, it was the first real English rock and roll record ever. Mommy, it was revolutionary. Move it for me. I grew up listening to those songs. Cliff was the English Elvis. Mothers said, don't watch him, he's too sexy. And the girls would all go, way. Cliff became an instant teen sensation. The screaming was absolutely ridiculous. We were standing in front of our amps, you know. Couldn't hear it. But to really hit the big time, Cliff and his band, The Shadows, went in search of a wider audience. One of our managers said, rock and roll is not going to last forever. You've got to broaden your appeal. I got myself a crying, talking, sleeping, walking, living down. It turned out that he could sing not only rock and roll, but he could sing ballads. Look at her hair. Well, it's surreal. Cliff's versatile new sound conquered the charts. His audience tripled, quadrupled overnight. He was mass market. He was right across the board. He was soon the biggest selling singles artist in the world. But as the 60s became a 70s, Cliff went out of fashion. The music scene had been changing quite a lot. In the 70s, glam rock comes along, and Cliff doesn't seem like such a big thing. Cliff's hits dried up. He lost credibility within the music industry. But in 1976, Cliff fought back with the perfect riposte to the critics. Devil Woman was a million seller. Brilliant, his first million seller in America. Suddenly, he'd been reinvented, and he was back with a vengeance. I mean, they were state-of-the-art records. 
Cliff re-established himself as one of the great British singing stars. Back at the top, Cliff powered through the 1980s. By the late 90s, Cliff's albums were still selling in their millions. But at nearly 60, some broadcasters reckoned he was past his sell-by date. His latest single entered the charts at number 10, yet many radio stations refused to play it. And it was him to not like Cliff. We don't play Cliff at John Virgin. He's not have. one of our artists. Yes. We wouldn't play him. It is a policy. They picked on it to show they were going to be modern, so Cliff had to go. It hurt him. It definitely hurts him. Cliff can be quite stubborn. He was determined to prove them wrong. In November 1999, Cliff released an anthem based on the Lord's Prayer to celebrate the coming millennium. It was a perfect commercial and spiritual thought in one. Cliff knew it connected with his audience, and he was right. 40 years after his very first hit, he was back at number one. He always manages to to come back. <laughs> he stays current, which is the true mark of a true talent. He survived everything, and that's because of the relationship between him and the British public. He's a phenomenon. <laughs> what is the Cliff song? If you on a desert island that could only have one of your songs to play, which one would you take? It's hard to... Let me answer it a different way. If a Martian landed here mm. on Earth and we all had to show him what you do, I'd play Devil Woman. Yeah. I'd say that, but, but otherwise, you know, I mean, I've, I've been so fortunate. Some of the songs you've been listening to, We Don't Talk Anymore is the biggest selling single I ever had. Mm. It's a perfect pop song. Devil Woman, what I, I find the perfection of that one is that it's got a great guitar riff, it's, it's kind of heavy in a way, it tells a story and it has a great chorus. Is it too much to say that Devil Woman took you from being uncool to cool again? I... I thought I was always cool. <laughs> well, I think it's other people I'm talking about. Just no. <laughs> For me, cool is, is the success. If someone is successful, I said, that is really cool. Someone said to me, a journalist said, come on, what reasons did you have for singing congratulations? And I said, about one and a half million. <laughs> <laughs> You've had 60-odd years of endless press speculation, which I know has incredibly irritated you, about your sexuality and the way you lead your private life and stuff. And you've quite rightly said, actually, it's nobody's business, and that you quite like being an enigma. When I it comes to it all. I love the word enigma because it means they don't understand what you're really about. Mm. And for me, I like that. For, I, don't, I don't know that I am an enigma, but the very fact that they don't understand me means that I probably am. You've had a number of girlfriends. Betty Clark, Janice Berry, Delia Wicks, Jackie Irving. Were you, were you a good boyfriend or a fly-by-night? I was, but, you know, I reckon that my career was so focused that I gave up on friends and even my family, but I, I removed myself from everything. Mm. One of your, your close friends uh, was the tennis player and TV presenter Sue Barker. Yes, we dated for a while, we were close, and we are still friends. Were you in love with her? I loved being with her, yes. But it wasn't something that was going to lead to our marriage, and it didn't. What about Una Stubbs? Well, everybody loved Una. She said, we've been keen on each other for a while and then turned into a romance, although I always kept very quiet about it. Even my closest friends didn't know. No, we were, I think, romantically involved. I like that phrase. Mm. We were. There's no doubt about it. What does it. that mean? And the funny thing is... Well, it just means that we wanted to be in each other's company. And it was. That's true for me, too. When, you know, it's in a romantic sense. I mean, that means... Sorry? In a romantic way. Yes, I bought the dinners. <laughs> <laughs> How many times in your life have you been properly in love? I think there were a couple of times when I felt... In fact, in the case of Jackie Irving, I went to my manager and said, if I got married, would I, would I survive my fans? He said, you might lose 25 30% of your fans. I went, are you kidding? <laughs> I'd lose a third. I broke up with Jackie. Seriously? I can't make you understand. No, I'm, I'm, I'm understanding. I'm, not, I'm, I'm just no, seeing I... a ruthlessly... I know I broke up, but I was very nice. Even when you thought you were nice in love with a woman, I did you wanted to marry... Goodbye. I did kiss her goodbye. Yet the moment you're told by your manager it might cost you, you know, a quarter or a third of your fans and success, bang, 
done, gone. Well, been not, even, not even really a second's thought. It's quite ruthless, isn't it? It just means I wasn't in love enough with her. But, of course, it doesn't... Just because you can't understand it doesn't make me ruthless. I was not going to give up all this work, all this focus mm. for that. I mean, how many times would you say you've had your heart broken? That's probably the arbiter of real love, isn't it? I don't think I've ever had my heart broken. Really? No, I don't think so, because otherwise I would have got married to someone and then you have my have to be married broken. to have your heart broken. Well, you have to be certainly strongly and t decidedly in love with someone you to have it broken. To, you've got to 80 without ever having your heart broken. You've never had that experience of really feeling... No. Wow. But why would I? Because everybody else does. I mean, if my heart's broken... I don't know anybody ever in my entire existence who I could say has never had a feeling of heartbreak. You see, I knew I was unique. <laughs> 20 years old is a tough age to lose your father. My anger comes out when I think that he missed the best things in my life. Let's go back 80 years to the very beginning. You were born Harry Roger Webb on the 14th of October 1940 in Lucknow in India. Uh, your dad was Roger Webb, who worked as a manager for catering contracts on the Indian Railway, and your mum was Dorothy. You have three younger sisters. You actually spoke Bengali for a while. Yeah. Can, um, you, can you remember it? Oh, Chuprao. What's that? Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> No, my mother said I was getting good at it. You know, when you're seven, I suppose you, you can pick it up easily. My friend was Bengali, so I probably picked up words. Did you get many japs? Jabs? Cuffs around the head, apparently. Oh, japs. Oh, japs. Oh, yeah, they called a jab. Oh, yeah, I have to get that. And uh, my dad was a disciplinarian. He was always make sure that I was up to scratch. Your family left India when it gained independence from Britain, arriving at Tilbury Docks in Essex on the 13th of September, 1948. And they arrived with five pounds, pounds sterling, equivalent to about two hundred pounds today. Yeah, for the whole family to start yeah, a new life. I guess he sold. I guess my dad sold everything we had. And we arrived with that, that little amount of money, and of course my dad couldn't get a job. You lived in your grandmother's neighbour's spare bedroom, sleeping on mattresses on the floor. Funny thing is, my sisters and I often used to get together, and I said to them once, "Do you remember being unhappy?" Mm. And they'd all say. No. And I said, nor do I. Now, how the heck did we get through that when, in fact, we can all remember three main meals a week was two slices of toast in a soup bowl with tea poured over it, milk and sugar. So that means they were pretty well poverty-stricken, and yet n none of us can remember being unhappy. Mm. You had a magical moment coming from India when you got here and something happened. You went to the window and you saw this weird stuff falling. Snow. <laughs> it was snow. Which you'd never seen? Never seen it in India. It's funny how that image of that stuff coming down... When I recorded Mistletoe and Wine or Saviour's Day, I can't help but think, I remember that first time when I saw snow. It was magical. It is magical. You went to school in Carshalton, uh, and you got bullied there. Why, yeah. why were you bullied? So I would have been dark-skinned at that, at that time, and they somehow knew I came from India. So they, they gave me... They called me Indie Bum. And I was always in battles on the, on the uh, playground. Well, it's interesting. In the book, I was startled by this. So, in your book, uh, The Dreamer, your new autobiography, you say, it might surprise people, but I was tough at school. I had to be. If the other boys went for me, I would get them on the floor and punch them until the blood flowed. <laughs> in fact, I don't remember ever losing a fight. I haven't read anything like this since Mike Tyson's autobiography. <laughs> 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 You wouldn't stop until you'd drawn blood. The guy had me by the wrist and I managed to turn it around and I flung him down, he was on the floor. And all I did was that and then there was all blood here and the bone and... I've never the... seen this side of you. I don't show it often. <laughs> <laughs> when was the last time you went flailing in at somebody? About, um, how old am I, 80? About 75 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about your mother, Dorothy. What kind of woman was she? She was a fantastic balance, because my dad was the disciplinarian, so if I got a job from the year old, you know, go, mum, 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 she'd always say, give you the hug and say, what did you do? 
you must have done something to upset your dad. And then in the end, you'd say, yeah, I'd think to myself, yeah, I did. And my father was the one that told me, OK, you really want to do this? And I said, yeah, this is just off. I just made my first record. It hadn't even been released. And I said, yeah, I, Dad, I really want to do this. He said, well, from now on, you're going to have to try to be the best you can for every time that you do anything. And I think that has filtered through to me. Otherwise, I don't think I'd have survived the years. Cliff, let's just go back now to when you were just a young one. Cliff was born in India, and the family left for Britain when he was seven. Their journey cost every penny they had. They had nothing, basically, and they lived in one room. His dad made the furniture out of bits of wood because they didn't have any money. Roger encouraged his son to be resourceful, too. His father, because he had to start all over again in this country, gave Cliff a very strong work ethic. He wanted to better himself. When Cliff reached his teens, a life-changing event gave him a dream to follow. He heard through a car window on a radio Elvis singing Heartbreak Hotel and thought, oh, what is that? That's what I want to do. Cliff thought, I could be that guy. So his father bought him his first guitar. And he talks about practicing in front of the mirror, you know, to get the curl of the lip and swivel and all the moves. With his family cheering him on, Cliff began performing on the gig circuit, where his vocal talents and sharp style made him stand out from the crowd. There he was, this apparition, with this bright, lurid pink jacket. But the interesting thing was the quality of his voice and the way he worked the audience that was so impressive. Cliff's success on the live scene quickly won him a recording contract. I got a woman mean as she can be. As Cliff rocketed up the charts, his career became a family affair when his dad, Roger, joined his management team. You could see the, the pride they had in what he was achieving. And Roger wanted to be in on the scene and have some involvement as a guiding hand, a guiding father. I love you, I love you. Cliff spent Christmas 1960 at number one. But it would be his family's last Christmas together. Roger was now seriously ill with lung disease and passed away five months later when Cliff was only 20. Cliff was really close to him. He broke his heart. He thought the world of him. He had a huge respect for his father for his opinions and guidance. And that was a big loss in Cliff's life. In his bereavement, Cliff's thoughts turned in a direction that would shape the rest of his life. He found that faith could provide some answers for him in his grief. He was at the top of his profession, but he began to realize the most important thing was to actually find value and meaning and purpose. In 1964, Cliff became a Christian. And two years later, he went public at a rally held by evangelist Billy Graham. I'm not just in show business because I want to become famous. I do it now because I, I can give that service to God and I can do things like this because my name happens to be Cliff Richard. But the media warned that his faith would lose him fans. The papers were saying this could kill his career in one move like that. As the country's top pop star, I thought it was like professional suicide for, for me. What a friend we have in Jesus. I thought it was courageous of him to be so honest about what he was feeling and what he wanted to do in his life. If Cliff Richard wants to do something, he'll just do it. He believes it, he'll do it. Twenty years old is a tough age to lose your father, especially when you're very close to him and he's such a, yeah. a pivotal influence in your life. Yeah, it wasn't easy for any of us, really. But he was a naughty person, you know, because he did smoke a lot. He was taken to a local hospital in Enfield. And when we went there once, the, the nurses were absolutely angry with him because he had found a way of secreting a safety pin. He was in an oxygen tin. And he, he, he learned... He, he's got his pin and he undone the thing and was unzipping it from inside and was about to light up. I mean, the whole thing would have gone up in flames. <laughs> but, you know, that was Dad. He was, he was also very single-minded. Uh, Did you know that he was dying? 
No, no, not until the doctors put him onto oxygen. I'm thinking, oh, my God, this is not going to end well. And he didn't last too long in that hospital. Did you get a chance to, to say what you wanted to say to him? No, I didn't. That's why I feel sometimes that my anger, if I've got any, comes out when I think that he missed the best things in my life. I mean, he, he never saw the knighthood. Everything like that, that he was the one that was right behind me, and when he became part of the management group, he's the one that really kept me on the tracks and would continue to remind me, this is what you've got to do. And so, for me, it was a, it was a horrible, horrible loss. Of all the things your father missed, what's the one moment you would have most liked him to have been able to see? When the Queen came to me with the sword, I was a nervous wreck, and when she tapped that on my shoulder, had my dad been there, it would have been fantastic. I would have loved him to have seen that. Did you speak to the Queen on the day? Did you say that? Well, we had to meet this guy beforehand, and he said, do not say anything unless the Queen says something to you. So I knelt there, and she put the sword on my shoulders. Then I was told to stand up and lean forward, and she will put the emblem around your neck. And then she said, Oh, it's been a long time coming. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I went, honestly, I was, um, <laughs> I was so overwhelmed. I, I, I said, but, um, what? And then I, I walked off. <laughs> and I, I said to my sisters, my sisters came uh, with me that day, and I said, I can't believe this happened to me. The Queen must have gone back and said, why didn't we give the knighthood to someone who could talk English? <laughs> <laughs> your decision to become a Christian, obviously a massively important moment in your life. What was the driving force for that? Well, the, the guy that got me interested was Brian Licorice Locking, who just, he just passed away uh, four or five days ago. He was a Jehovah's Witness. He was very vocal about what he believed. He was proud of it. And so I, it started me off thinking. Got back to the Bible and I started reading the New Testament. I found out things that I didn't even know. And so there came a point in my life when I'd met friends who were Christians and they'd say, well, the thing is, Jesus loves you, he wants you, but you got to ask him to be part of your life. And I did, that's what I did one night. I, I, sat, I lay on my bed, I said, please, come into my life and, and change me. I suddenly realized that I could actually be the person I was and still be a Christian. And so that's how, it, that's how it's been ever since. The horrifying thing for you, I guess, would have been, how do you disprove this? I'm thinking, I could actually end in prison as an innocent man. Gary Barlow is a fan of yours, and in fact, he invited you to take part in one of his crooner sessions during the lockdown. It's so Fantastic. So that. <laughs> So that was in lockdown, and you and Gary Barlow obviously in, in different places. But... Yeah, I was in my bathroom. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, the, when they say do this, I know the expectancy from the public have become quite low. You know, they don't expect you to be sounding mm. like your records, but I like to get close. So I found, I tried everywhere, and I thought, wait a minute, the bathrooms have always got lots of tiles. So I sang over the bath, which is also a great echo, and that's why I sounded better than Gary. <laughs> 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 I don't think there is anybody in pop history who's had fans quite like yours. There aren't many fan bases who would actually come to a Life Story show wearing Cliff Richard masks. That's the dedication. I mean, I'm surprised that I don't have one. <laughs> in fact, I'm hoping to get one before I go. <laughs> <laughs> Over the years, uh, your fans have shown their love for you in some unusual ways. There was a parcel delivered to you at a venue in Edinburgh. Do you remember? Yeah, I do. I'll never forget it. This box was, like, that big. And I thought... And it was quite heavy. I thought, someone has sent me a television. <laughs> I thought, that's great. Anyway, and as I opened it, this girl jumped out 
It wasn't just me. The, the rest of us in there nearly had heart attacks. <laughs> and then she said, could you sign this for me? <laughs> Was an autograph all she ended up with? Oh, she got an autograph and a kiss on both cheeks. <laughs> <laughs> have you received marriage proposals from fans? You must have done. Oh, uh, well, when I first started, yeah, but I've had people claim that I was the father of their child. Yes, I know. One woman wrote to you with the big news that you'd fathered her child in Brighton. I know, and I was in Bournemouth that day. <laughs> <laughs> Cliff, as you grew from pop star to national institution, it seemed as if congratulations were in order. The child is a king, the carolers sing. In 1988, Cliff marked 30 years in the business and his latest number one was a cracker. Cliff and Christmas go together like turkey and stuffing, really, don't they? Christmas time. In my career, fighting Cliff for the Christmas number one was, like, the hardest thing I ever had to do. Cliff's had four festive chart toppers. A record rivaled only by the Beatles. He's managed to balance those two worlds of music, the Christian music and his pop life, and they seem to just merge really well. People know that Cliff has a deep faith, and therefore his Christmas songs actually do have an extra meaning. Cliff's beliefs have also shaped his life outside music. Cliff is also a wonderful philanthropist, and he's helped a lot of charities. He knows how marvellous a life he's had coming from nothing, so he's always wanted to give back. Over the last 50 years, Cliff has raised millions for Christian charity Tear Fund and supported humanitarian projects around the world. He's been involved in Africa, in Bangladesh, travelling to visit those communities where health or perhaps clean water is an issue. Well, the water comes down the pipe from the hill and comes out of this fountain, and, of course, it's really good water and it's, it's drinkable. He doesn't sort of brag about his charities, he just does them quietly. For his charitable achievements in 1995, he was knighted by the Queen. Cliff was so proud when he became a sir. You could see the beam across his face. This was the first time that a British pop star had been knighted. It was an incredible accolade, hugely deserved. I can't think of anywhere in the world I'd rather be than here, and I'm sure this is going to be a great sing-along. As a knight of the realm, Cliff became a fixture at state occasions. All going on a holiday, no From VE Day commemorations to the Queen's Jubilees. The organisers turned to Cliff because they know he has the widest possible appeal. Cliff has really woven himself into the fabric of, of British life. Got myself a bright sleep. He's very much part of the establishment and treated with great respect, and he really enjoys that status. But Cliff's gilded role in public life was dramatically derailed in August 2014. Without warning, police searched his Berkshire home. As part of an investigation into allegations of historic sexual offences, which he vehemently denied. I just knew it was wrong. But the torture that he went through in the process of the investigation, there was night after night when he never slept. We saw how thin he got. I remember once giving him a hug, and all I could feel were just bones. I just felt so deeply sorry for him. Cliff was never arrested, but it took two years for prosecutors to announce that he would face no charges. In 2018, he won damages from South Yorkshire police and the BBC for breaching his privacy through coverage of the original police search. But Cliff's ordeal had left deep scars. I don't believe you can be through excruciating pain like that without it having a long-term effect. And I do think it took a terrible toll on him. Well, it did take a terrible toll. Yeah, it did. And this was the worst period of your life. The moment that you first heard about the police search, you were at your home in Portugal. How did you hear the news? I was going to join my sister, her partner, and uh, a friend of mine to go to the winery of the guy that introduced winemaking to me. And a phone call went just as we were packing the car. And it was f the manager of the apartment I owned in England. I said, what's the matter? He said, well, the police are here, and they have a warrant to search your apartment. And I went, oh. Well, look, if they have a warrant, 
let them in, because otherwise they can break the door down. So they let them in, and to this, this day, I don't know what they found. And what were you thinking when you heard that? I didn't know at all. It was when we got in the car and started to drive that both my sister's phone and my friend John's phone was ringing, were ringing. And slowly, we heard the story. And apparently, it, had been, it was on television. And in the end, when we got to where we were going, and we turned the TV on, and that's when I saw my apartment uh, being rifled by the police. It was an extraordinary thing for the BBC to do. It kind of put the BBC stamp on this, almost telling people, we think this is true. That was the damaging part of it. They wanted that one o'clock in the afternoon scoop where they were the only station that told everybody about what happened. And it was before the investigation had started, before I'd heard what the accusation was. So I couldn't figure out how they could do this. And the horrifying thing for you, I guess, would have been, well, how do you disprove this? It was something I didn't expect in my life, and for it to have been a false accusation makes it all the more painful. My accuser said that when he was 13, he was abused by Sir Cliff, and um, it was in a Billy Graham crusade, and, and he said, but he can't remember whether it was 1980, 81, 82, or 83. Now, when I checked the diary, I was with Billy Graham on eight, in 85. Now, I can't figure how the guy couldn't remember which year he was 13. Because if he was 13 and 80, it would have been 18 and 85. So there would have been no story to tell. The day after the raid, uh, your good friend John McKellen, he found you sobbing on the kitchen floor. What, what were you feeling? I had fallen down because what I had thought was, oh, my God, I'm in a, in a pit and I don't know how to get out of this pit. My career rests on it. Everything, everything that I'd lived for rested on this. I'm thinking, I could actually end in prison as an innocent man. And suddenly, my, my, I, my legs just went wobbly and I went to the floor. And thank heavens, it was John that came in. And he, he got on the floor and said... He, he was a priest, so he, he obviously has a way of dealing... Just for those who don't know John, he was a New York priest... Yes. ..and became a very good friend. And he shares your life, your home, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And he just said to me, did you do this? And I said, of course not. He said, have you ever done anything like this? I went, absolutely not. He said, then... I believe you, God believes you, stand up, you can do this. Did you think it was all over? These allegations are so bad that whatever happens here, I'm done. I did think that, yeah. I was embarrassed to go out. I mean, I was embarrassed because I thought somebody might believe it. Two years go by without even you that's, being arrested. I mean, the whole thing is, it's like a slow form of torture. Sometimes I'd wake up, you know, in the night and I'd feel the pulses going boom, boom, in my head, my heart, and I thought, I could die of a heart attack. When everything was dropped and you won the action against the BBC, a yeah. substantial amount of money, did you have a moment where you actually thought, oh, God, this is over? I sat there and all I could feel was ultimate relief. That was the real end of everything. I was able to start smiling and feel that I'd really, really got past the whole thing. Your sisters must have been very important in that time. Tragically, Donna died. Yeah, that must was, have been another hammer blow to you. She was still alive, fortunately, when she heard that the police had pulled out and that there was no more. In fact, the last memory of her I have, she was in bed, very sick. She died not long after that, but my sisters and I were there visiting her and I told her it's all over. And she just reached up and my, I could feel her hand now on my cheek. Fantastic. My last memory, that's the last time I saw her. She, she did that for me. It's, so, it's just so much of beauty in the world, and that was, for me, it's like being forgiven by someone who didn't have to forgive me. Her last touch of my face is what I'll remember her for. The secrets of your youth, do any of them involve artificial help of the surgical variety? Now, every year for the last 42 years, you've released an official best-selling calendar, selling three million copies. We've got a classic Cliff calendar shot here. Ah. I mean, that is... That's sort of... It's almost Baywatchy, that one, isn't it? <laughs> Touch of the Hasselhoff's going on there. You were in your 70s there. 
Well, I've told them if, we're, if they want to do another calendar, I'm, I'm not taking my shirt off ever again. <laughs> I'm past that. Is that your body, though, right? Yes, it is my body. I mean, that, you were... Uh, but that's 70... not my head. <laughs> <laughs> well... The secrets of your youth, do any of them involve artificial help? Of the surgical or Botox uh, variety? I, t oh, I tried Botox and uh, my eyebrows fell off. <laughs> well, they actually fell down. It got rid of furrows in my forehead, but my eyebrows dropped. <laughs> and I didn't like the look, so I, I didn't bother. You know, when I smile, I get about six lines. I'd like to say to someone, can you get rid of three oh, of them? Please. <laughs> please. I'm 55. I look nothing like that. Well, just have a... Instead of having a facelift, have a body lift. <laughs> In the autumn of 2018, with the investigation and legal proceedings finally over, Cliff got back to doing what he loves most. It's where he should be in the recording studio. Can you give me more volume? What's happened has happened, and he just picks himself up and carries on. Popular music is Cliff Richard's life. He's not going to give it up. They're never going to break me down. It was Cliff's first album of original material in over a decade. You know I'm gonna rise up feeling strong. And the title track, Rise Up, sent a message to the world. It was a kind of cathartic album. It said, although it's been difficult and a bumpy ride, I'm strong, I'm coming back, and I will rise up. Cliff soon took his new material out on the road. He's now been performing live for 64 years. Go to a Cliff concert these days, it's staggering how well his voice has held up. She's just a devil woman. And he still cares about the songs. You can see that they still mean something to him. I saw him at the Albert Hall, bump, having a rock and doing it, smashing. Cliff has always sold out wherever he's played, anywhere in the world. It sells out in 24 hours. He knows the public want him to do it. And I think his commitment to the public has been amazing. In return, Cliff's army of fans are renowned for their devotion. I can't believe... Do you love me? Yeah. Oh, no. Cliff has an incredibly loyal following. I think once a Cliff fan, you stay a Cliff fan. The young ones. Well, Cliff's fans the love him. Ones. They'll buy tents and camp outside of the theatres to get to the front row. I and mean, they absolutely adore him. Very long. Can you quiet down? I can't hear me. <laughs> As Cliff begins his ninth decade... Remember, it's just a number. ..he's still at the top of his game. I want to see his birth certificate. I don't believe he's 80. He's aged really well. He looks fabulous. He looks like 30. And he isn't. I'm furious. He works out, plays a lot of tennis. Yeah, he looks good. The bastard. <laughs> To mark his 80th birthday, Cliff's about to release a brand new record. It's his 105th album in what has been a truly extraordinary career. Cliff might be 80, but he is still very curious musically. He's interested in trying things that he hasn't done before. Cliff always feels there's more to do. Never mind about Cliff's 18th birthday. I think he'll want a hit album when he's 100 years old. Cliff will go on forever, cos he cannot give up music. He just loves it so much. Cliff, a very, very happy 80th. Cliffy, happy birthday, my friend. Be well, be safe. I love you very much, and I hope that you have 80 more. You may have never married, but you've got some cracking friends, I have to say. Look, I've got two beautiful blondes that love me deeply. <laughs> a whole lot of guys that quite like me. <laughs> <laughs> what can you ask for? Have you ever wondered what you might have been if you hadn't been a singer? A loser. <laughs> <laughs> it's, hard to, it's hard for me to even think about that. I love it. I still love recording. Being in a studio to me is like a dream. And I think you love audiences. You know, even when you came out today, we got a, a far smaller crowd than normal because of the pandemic, but you, you just reacted immediately to yeah. an audience applauding. Yeah, I do, and I wasn't expecting a, la a large audience because I knew it was yours. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know how to get a crowd on your side, don't you, Cliff Richard? Um, I've been doing it for 62 years. <laughs> 
even though you're 80, I mean, you cracked it in every decade, just part of you think, you know what? My big one's still to come. At this age, I would be happy to do anything that I thought was going to be good for me and good for the audience. But I don't know what that will be. So you just have to click your heels and wait. One thing you could have done is you could have made more wine because we're both wine lovers and we've got one of your wines here. You've got one as well. Oh, oh. Uh, this is one of yours. This is the Vida Nova Reserva. The red wines are mostly a grape called Aragonese. It's always soft, warm, full. Oh, delicious. It feels like it's got longevity, a long finish. It's got a little aggressive streak. That's the, that's it, the Aragonese. This is the Cliff Richard of wines, really, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Finally, I would put good money on me leaving this planet before you, the way things are going. <laughs> so, in the unlikely event that you ever actually die, which is, in the moment, seems just well, I'm not an impossible... I'm, I, I have to admit, I'm not planning it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's not in my Well, plans. in the unlikely event, you turn out to be immortal. Yes. How would you like to be remembered? The melody maker did a criticism of my show when I went to Belfast once. Rock and roll and God work well together in the hands of someone who loves them both. <laughs> That's what I want on my tombstone. That's a lovely message. Sir Cliff Richard, thank you very much indeed. Piers, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Sir Cliff Richard. Thank you. Thank you. You don't want to miss being a fly on the wall in this relationship. Brand new Olivia Meets Her Match starts next on ITVB. And we have a brand new thriller across four nights here on ITV. The Sister starts tomorrow night at nine. We'll stay there for the latest ITV news on the way next. <laughs>